Awesome. So AI is going to take your job. And if you let it, AI will actually take your job to the next level. Because if it's used in the right way, and the right way is important, it can save four hours a week, you can attract and retain staff, and more importantly, you can become a trusted advisor. And you're probably thinking, yeah, right, I've heard this before. And I get that a lot. I get a lot of things around, okay, is it really uh, living up to the hype? What can it do for me? And fine, I've got a day job. How do I get my clients to return their files on time? And that's normal. And that's why I'm here today, folks. I'm really looking forward to sharing my knowledge on digital transformation toolbox and helping you prepare for the future of accounting. The future is broad. There's lots of possibilities. So I'm really looking forward to just to having a conversation with you, sharing my insights, knowledge, experience. And my goal is to ultimately help you prepare, but also define your future. Don't let the future happen to you. Let's prepare for it together. But before I start, I want to hear from you. How do you feel about the future of accounting? So just in the in the chat there, just put either a one, two, three, or four. Are you excited? Are you overwhelmed? You're taking it day by day? Or are you feeling something else? So let's get those fingers moving in the chat. Let's see what you're saying around the, the future of accounting. Seeing lots of ones pop up. A couple of threes. So taking it up by day by three there from Sean. Lots more ones, a three. No one's feeling overwhelmed. That's good. <clears throat> and this is pretty typical, folks. I'm actually seeing a trend here, which I see with a lot of the accounting workshops and speaking I do. I, I speak with the CPA organization, both in Calgary, Canada, across Canada, and also in the Northwest Pacific area as well, Washington State. And this comes up time and time again. There's either excitement, let's go, or there's I'm busy, got the day job, I'm just taking day by day. That's pretty typical. But the good news is today, I'm going to give you both of you, both of those groups, something to learn. We're going to talk about how to be excited, the new technologies. We're going to talk about AI. We're going to talk about digital transformation. We're going to talk about how you manage people, how you attract and retain people. But we're also going to talk about some priorities. How do you manage your day job at the same time? And you're probably asking, well, that's great, John, but how do you know that? So let me introduce myself because... Similar to accountants and finance professionals, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a nerd, a geek. We love our numbers. I'm more I, IT. Ever since I was a young lad, I've loved my technical things, radio controlled car, bought my first computer, my Commodore 64, back when I was a teenager, a young 13-year-old. Hand, hands up if you used to use a, a Commodore 64. This one had the tape drive, though. Sorry, this one had the disk drive. We had a tape drive. So I always went to around my friend's house who had a disk drive. It loaded the games much faster, but managed to get the Hello World programming. And that's why I love, that's why I fell in love with computing and technology because it it creates consistency when it's used in the right way. And you might not feel that because technology today can be infuriating. But with that love, I joined a financial services company in the UK and got to do my dream job, actually. I got to work on a basic AI project back in the early 2000s, where we were creating insurance quotes, life insurance quotes, based on inputs from customers. So it'd fill in a form, and it automatically produce a quote. These days, you're thinking, yeah, we can do that on the online. Of course you can. But this was early 2000s. The internet had only just been around since the, the mid-90s for us. So early 2000, this was groundbreaking. But the life took a bit of a turn for us, actually. In uh, early 2000s, my wife got a cough and it wouldn't go away and went to see a doctor. And unfortunately, what he said, flawed us. She, she, had, she had cancer. She had Hodgkin's lymphoma. So after a long, grueling uh, uh, treatment of chemotherapy and radiotherapy, we got through it. So we were really pleased. It was a tough point in our lives, but she got through it. But what that inspired me to do and really thinking about how technology can inspire, inspire us and transform our lives is how do we how do we move country? We wanted to leave the UK. So I joined Ernst & Young in the UK, got to work with some amazing Fortune 500 companies. 
And then an a couple of years later, the opportunity came up. This is us packing up for Canada. And in 2005, we arrived in Canada and realized one of our lifelong dreams. Got to work. Then I had a role I couldn't pass up. Got to work with Deloitte, working with some even larger North American companies. And then in the back of the mind, I was thinking, we want to set up our own company, work together with my wife and our small team and help companies like yours really get some results. And that's where we set up WeDeliverYourVision.com. So here we are now. And I'm going to share more about this with you. And the reason I can talk to you about digital transformation is because I've recently just gone through it. So this is, I just want to share a quick challenge from Lisa. It's, I'll call her Lisa. She was my client. But effectively, like you folks, struggling with navigating the regulatory changes. It seems like only every other day we get a new change and then they're complex. How do we work through that? And there's a trick with AI, we can do that. And hopefully you, could, you folks can also share some of that. But you also need to scale. You need to grow. You need to attract new clients. Even if it's just maintain your existing clients, you need to replace the clients that move on. So there's always some element of scaling and growth required. And then if nothing else, you just need to attract and retain good CPAs, good accountants, because the number one success factor in business today is continuity. Having people continue to work with you. Changing people is expensive, time consuming. So today we're going to talk about that. You're thinking, why does how does digital transformation help with people? Well, spoiler alert, if you have good technology and you attract, you're going to attract the certainly the younger generation, but also the people who want to work with new technology. So it's important to embrace that because then you're going to attract and retain good talent, but then you're also going to become more efficient. But before we get into that, I want again, I want to hear from you in the chat. What's your biggest challenge when you think about digital transformation, IT, business, scaling, regulatory changes? What are you working? What do you find most challenge out there? Is it people? Is it technology? Filings? Maybe something else. And feel free to come off mute as well, folks. Don't think you need to use the chat. Happy to have people just pitch in as well. There's a mic there saying the getting the company to prioritize digitalization. Okay, I love your choice of words there, the digitalization, which is moving on from digitization to say, okay, how do we digitalize the business? And I'm assuming you mean there in terms of more IT to streamline processes and leverage the better technology. And the Stuart, the prioritization, prioritizing, yep. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter about the technology. If we can't prioritize our workloads, we can't spend time on that technology. And then Tammy, the resistance, executive sponsorship. I'm assuming, Tammy, that's for uh, new technology projects or digital transformation, or maybe it's other projects. But uh, yeah, let me know which what they're not sponsoring or what they are resisting. Um, I think in general, everyone's is resistant to change, <laughs> but okay. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I also find that if, you know, you don't have executive sponsorship and leadership on these transformation efforts, it's a short trip to disaster. Mm, yep. Very much so. And, and building on that as well, it's the, the leadership executives at the tone at the top, but then it's how does that message trickle down? So what I've seen is very good sponsorship, but then you have this, uh, what do you call it? The, the the slushy middle where you have the ground level staff really keen to do this, the executive really wanting to do this, and then this middle management area where they're like, mm, well, I, I think we'll just leave it be for the moment. And that's sometimes where it falls down as well. And I've had to overcome that a couple of times. But yeah, thanks for sharing, Tammy. That, that's perfect. And then uh, Marty, similar, they're changing people's mindset, similar to that. Uh, Tatiana saying the challenge to change processes, implementing new systems and the obsolete old systems. Yeah, the, the technical debt. So that's, that's interesting and great because we're going to cover these things because we're going to talk about a bit of mindset. We're going to talk a bit about the change and we're going to talk about the upgrades as well. So I'm going to come back to these questions. I'm going to make a note here. because I want to make sure we come back to those before the end of the session to make sure we cover these. Let me just save the chat. 
Okay, cool. And again, feel free to come off mute, put your hand up, comment in the chat. Again, this is a this is a discussion as much as anything else. The real value, I love these sessions, but the real value comes from you asking the questions, me answering what you have the pro most pressing needs, but also what other people are doing. As Marty's no doubt had with previous sessions, the discussions about what you're doing and where you're facing is the, the real goal that you can share with other people because chances are if you'll have that question, someone else will as well. So let's define digital transformation because there's a lot of misconceptions out there. There's even a lot of moving away from digital transformation to call it business transformation because it truly isn't just about the technology. And here's the definition that I like most. And I actually came up with this because it wasn't quite one that worked. So you think about digital transformation, it's the overhaul of a process, applying new technology to create that customer value. And that's important, folks, because you need to focus. I'm just going to draw on this one as well. You need to focus on that customer value. Because without that, what's the point of the IT? What's the point of the system? What's the point of the process? What's the point of training people? It needs to create some sort of value. And when I say customer, it could be internal customers or could be external customers. It doesn't have to be the always external. But knowing this really helps frame out digital transformation. And it's, as I said, it's not a system upgrade. It's not necessarily a big project. And it's not always run by IT, although it can be. So knowing that, here's how it can work for you. We're going to break it down. I love frameworks. I love models. You can use this in your business. It doesn't matter how big or small. You can rate your own business based on how the digital adoption. So how much technology you adopt, the maturity, as in how well it's implemented. And then here's the here's the key. Remember that customer value? That's here. That's how well it's implemented with the technology to create value for your customers. And here's a neat way to remember this. Let's talk about a compact car. Small little car, doesn't go very fast, doesn't have a whole many people, but it's very efficient. So it has low adoption of the technology and doesn't deliver much very often, but it gets the job done just very slowly. Then we talk about minivans. I love minivans. I don't have kids, but I still have minivans. I have two dogs, but I actually have three dogs now. We just adopted a or fostered a, a brand new puppy last week. So we have a, a rescue border collie which we're still working with right now you might even hear the barks in the background every now and again but we i love minivans but they have very good delivery very practical but don't, aren't necessarily sporty fast so they don't deliver a lot of technology so then you talk about the sports coupe your m5s or your your sporty sedans these do a lot of technology very quickly but they're not as practical as a minivan so then you get up to that digital option so what tops it off? That's the sporty SUV, the luxury SUV. Has the practicality of a minivan, speed and luxury of a sports sedan. So the question here is, okay, that's great, but what does that mean for me and my business? Well, there's actually metrics to prove profitability here. So on average, the compacts, if you're slow to adopt new technology, you're going to be 24% less profitable than is industry average. And this is all industries, all, all companies. Whereas a minivan, because of the maturity around delivery is good, but the adoption isn't there for technology, you're still, you are actually going to be in a good, better place. So it's 9%. Oops. Whereas a sports coupe, as you can probably guess, is less than that. It's minus 11% than industry average. So it doesn't get the value from the, the technology it puts in place. Puts lots of technology in, but spends a lot of money doing it. And then you get to the, the SUV, and that's where we get to the gold, the 26% above industry average. So this is proven, folks. This is proven in terms of using technology in the right way, delivering it in the right way will make you more profitable. And so where, where are you in this, this quadrant? I'm going to ask you in a second, which car are you? But just to give you some perspective, and this isn't an exact science, but education, government, typically in the slower areas, to get the job done, just a bit slower. Whereas construction, insurance, energy, 
again, more mature, but less technology adoption. Whereas when you get faster technology, you're looking at travel, telecom, manufacturing, they embrace technology faster and more, more aggressively. And then you get into big tech, the Googles, banking, for the real fast adoption of technology, but also about customer value. They start to dial it in. And by the way, as, as Marty said, we'll send you a copy of these slides. You can do this yourselves, refer to it. But what I'm going to ask you now is, where are you? Which car are you? And for this one, we're going to do a quick poll. So let me bring this up on screen. Go back here. I'm going to launch the poll. You should see the poll pop up now. So are you a sporty SUV? Are you a coupe? Are you a compact, a minivan, or maybe something else? I've had some interesting vehicles pop up in my quizzes when I do this, but in the chat, just let me know what type of other vehicle you are. So we've got about 50% of people answered now. It's creeping up a bit more. I'm just looking uh how we share the results. One second, folks. I just need to make sure we can share this. So I'm going to end the poll and share the results. There we go. Perfect. So this is fascinating, folks. A lot of you are saying sporty SUV. That's good. It means you're in that creating that high value from digital transformation. I'd love to hear more about that. I'd love to hear, I'm sure others would as well, because we've got some minivans, we've got some coupes, and got a uh, just one compact out there as well. So a pretty good spread, but a lot of sporty SUVs. You guys are advanced. Love it. This is cool. And Tammy there saying other. Uh, just curious, Tammy, why, why do you say other? What's what's your thinking there? I'm in the banking industry, but my bank is, you know, basic. <laughs> so they want this, the sporty SUV, but they want to pay for the Yugo. So it's right. <laughs> it's, its own challenge. Yeah. And you, you touch on an interesting point as well, because this, it may be your company is not one of these things. It might actually be a combination because an individual department could be in the sporty SUV. Sorry, sorry. Oops. No, let's go back here. An individual department could be a sports sedan, whereas the company overall could be a, a compact. So again, it depends on the teams. I've I've worked with clients where there's an innov innovation team who are really off the charts in terms of technology, but as an overall company, they're more of a between a minivan and a compact. They, they're slow to market, but internally, they're doing a lot of experimentation. And by the way, that creates burnout because people get frustrated if they don't see the results of their efforts. So you have to be so, careful about how you manage that. So, excuse me, John. I I thought the question was. What do we consider ourselves, not necessarily I, the company? And because the companies, I think, would all want to be sporty SUVs overall, but for whatever reason, don't get there. But individuals themselves, we can judge better what what our thinking is. And so um, uh, if that's the case, I would say my company is a sporty SUV, but I'm more of a coupe. Okay, yeah, that's that's good clarity. Actually, when I say you, it's uh, you, you're the first one to actually point that out. But that's good to make sure I clarify that. But yes, generally speaking, when people answer, they answer on behalf of their company. But to your point, if you're answering on behalf of yourself, that's also good as well. Because what I want to do today is take you through some some secrets that will actually help you move up the scale. And whether that's moving from a compact to a, a, a minivan or maybe a compact to a, a sedan, the journey doesn't really matter, but it's the movement that matters. And that's where digital transformation comes in. So Simmer, great point. Love it. Because if we can move you through a transformation, that means you'll transform your team and your company as well. So let's get into it. I want to talk about three secrets you need to know for digital transformation and preparing for the future of accounting. 
And we're going to cover these quite fast, folks. Usually this is a one day workshop and I'm compressing it into the next uh, 35 minutes to make sure we finish in the hour. But I'll, I'll be around for questions afterwards as well. But the point here is that we want to go through these three secrets around targets, technology and team. It's not all about technology. And my goal, I want to help you find and fix inefficiencies, the challenges that are holding you back, whatever it is. We talked about priorities. We talked about people. We talked about the um, the resistance to change. So if I don't, well, make sure we cover these. If we don't cover it on my slides, we'll make sure we have a conversation. Okay, we ready? Let's get into targets. So targets are important because it's all around the maturity here. Without knowing where you're going, anywhere's a destination. There's a lot of sayings around making sure you have a goal, a North Star. And that's so, so important, folks, because if you're just experimenting without a goal to save time, money, deliver a new product to market, you have to have that direction because otherwise you end up getting busy on and distracted on work that doesn't contribute to your goal. And if you've not watched Simon Sinek, anyone who's watched Simon Sinek, he's awesome. I, I watch him all the time. He did a start with the why video and you'll, <laughs> you'll notice that from judging from his, uh, his fashion, this is a, a, an older video. It's actually 2007 or eight, I think it is, but I still watch it today, starting with why. And I'll dig up the, uh, let me find the link for you on YouTube. But if you search YouTube, Simon Sinek and start with why, he does a very good TED talk on why a why is important. It's not about the what or the how, because everyone knows that. It's about your why. Because your why is a target to meet. And it's a differentiator because trust me, folks, if you crack this, that'll meet, create meaning for you, but also for your team. Because most people get meaning from their work. I think there was a survey saying, yeah, there was a survey just the other day by um, PwC saying that 70% of people find meaning in their jobs, their employment. That means people are turning up to work with you and your businesses for looking for meaning. Maybe you're looking for that meaning. So that's what you need to create. If you don't have this, this is the first thing to do. And that's why I have it number one. So what's some examples of this? So I've done this recently. I did this a number of times. And here's some examples. So for an insurance client of mine, they wanted a three and a half day work week. You think, you jump? what? Why, why would they not work five days? And that's not the point. The point was they wanted to compress the work into three and a, five, three and a half days to make it more efficient. And to do that, they were actually reducing their financial reporting using automation. And I'll show you the case study later down to three days. But this meant you could free up time for what you love most, spending time with family. Maybe it was more work. Maybe it was just doing strategic projects. Maybe it was spending time with clients, getting feedback. Point was, people that actually didn't go home for that one and a half day saving, they actually stayed at work, they actually did the job, but they had a purpose to improve how they worked, be more efficient, free up time for better, more interesting work. It can be financial, although that's not great, but it's what the financial enables. So maybe you have a, tar a revenue target by a certain year. This, this client had a 125 million revenue by the end of this year for one of my manufacturing clients. The point wasn't the money. The point was that they could use that to either donate to charity, invest in their people for training, and invest in new equipment. That was the below the line items that motivated people. And again, that was their why. And then from a healthcare client I'm working with, they wanted fewer emails. It was actually for their HR team. They wanted. To, they ended up getting 67% fewer emails by producing some AI and chatbots to respond to common questions by email, and that reduced the emails. And I love this. The learning metaverse. So this healthcare client had a lot of education for both internal for employees, but also for its patients. So they actually wanted to create a learning metaverse where you come in and you have virtual reality experience around learning, not just the online courses. So this is a future goal. This is We don't even have the clarity on this yet, but we know the North Star we're working towards. So this is targets, folks. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to give you a bit of a takeaway. Because again, we're covering this quite quickly. Normally, this is a breakout, but I'm going to give you homework. I want to make sure you know your why, your target. 
So take this away. We're not going to do it now because we don't have the time, but I want to make sure that you know what your why is. What's the, how do you help your clients? What's the result, the outcome? Because Continue that's the I first thing you do. For 20 miles. <laughs> Someone's still driving. I guess that's their target is go north for 25 miles. So there you go. Thank you. <laughs> but again, the point is, folks, think about this. Even if it just takes five minutes, you need to know what your target is because that will drive everything you do. So you'll notice at the bottom, folks, we're going through three areas. We're going through targets, technology, and team, the three secrets that I talked about. We're just now coming to the end of targets. This is a compressed version. There's usually a lot more detail in terms of working through this. Before I move on to technology, the next one, any questions so far? Anything you want to ask me more? Is anything you want to see more of, see less of before we get into the technology section next? I think we can move on, John. Okay, let's do it. Let's keep going. And by the way, I'm going to share a link later on with a, a free a self-assessment you can do. So we talked about that uh, digital mat maturity for you individuals. You can do it for your company. It's 12 questions, takes two minutes, but it gives you a very detailed report to help you. And it's free, completely free. And it gives you a report on how you can improve your efficiency and, uh, and ultimately get time back in your business. So I'll share that later. Let's talk about technology. So again, it's this digital adoption here. Why does technology matter? Because it's a game changer. We have to use technology. We cannot not use technology anymore. And if you look at accounting in terms of financial services, these are the technology accelerators. And we're going to focus on today just these two because we don't have enough time to get into ERP, data, data analytics, Power BI dashboards. These are the five enablers that I see I use most with my clients but we'll focus on just these two today. But I'm curious for you, what, what technology are you using? So we don't have a poll for this one, so maybe just comment in the chat. Which which technology have you implemented recently or, or working on? This is you and your business, not you personally. So your business, are you working on automation, data analytics? You can put the number in the chat or comment if there's another technology that's not on the list. How are you using technology these days? Okay, so, yeah, Tom with the Power BI, yep, data analytics, lots of AI, ERP upgrades. Yep, one or a couple of automate, a few automations coming in there. A few more AIs, love it. Okay, uh, Ganesh, all of the above, awesome. Love that. That's cool. Yeah. So I'd love, uh, Ganesh, if you're there, I'd love to hear more from you in terms of what, when you're using all of them, what's the yeah, outcome? Yeah. What's the why yeah. that you're yeah, achieving you, there? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. I can. Yeah. I started the role uh, last week. Uh, one of the responsibility for me is to ERP. We are, we are uh, embarking on SAP S4 HANA implementation on a cloud based. Mm. Then uh, also the with the data lake. Uh, then uh, automation, UPA, like uh, RPA, RPA using uh, automation anywhere, UAE path. Nice. Also data lake and the Power BI. So th that's, uh, I we laid the roadmap. So my job is to make sure it's a successful implementation, en engage the key stakeholders. Uh, but no AI right now, but we want to make sure the systems are solid, foundation is laid out, there's a clean data, then we can build up an AI on that. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to challenge you a bit here. So why? What's the outcome? Because technology is an enabler. Remember, if you just do technology adoption, yeah. you're going to be in that that sporty sedan. So why? What's the outcome you're getting the value? Maybe a time factor. Uh, the company is also getting ready to be an IPO in the future. So we want mm -hmm. to make sure what we can take up in the next couple of years to keep the systems. Uh, ERP was identified as a core system, as a foundational system. So, right. so so we are putting that as first and on top of that uh, process simplification automation and we are, we, are, we are building that is scaling that okay so it's we're working towards the ipo right 
Okay. And the reason I mention that again, back to the targets we just covered, that's important because when you get busy, when it gets stressful, because it will yeah. with technology, where are we heading? What's that goal? Yeah, yeah. It is the roadmap, but uh, currently the time frame we can't take up everything. Mm. Hmm, exactly. And that's the thing. That's why the other reason for the North Star IPO yeah. is good because it will prioritize your work. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you. And uh, Mike there as well with the Python, Power, PowerShell, Visual Studio, Power BI with service accounts. Awesome. So you guys, you guys are advanced. I love this. This is brilliant. So I do usually when I go through this, I talk about automation. This is 101 automation. And I love the, uh, the analogy. This is my border colleague, Kyla with my wife, we do agility training. And the reason I'm showing this is because when automation is good, it happens, it's a consistent result. And Kyla will just do that. This is a repeat, but Kyla would just do weaves over and over and again. I'm gonna have to stop that because it's uh, starting to uh, starting to make me a bit dizzy. But the point is, this is how you streamline user automation. It's reliable, consistent, and efficient, but you have to do it in the right way. So the first thing you do is audit, audit the process. This is how you streamline financial reporting as a case study that I used. So it sounds like Mike, you've already done this. If you're using that Python PowerShell, that's, that sounds like a financial reporting type situation. Some of the others are with data analytics. So with a highly audit, highly manual process, we did an audit. We found data quality issues and the team was burnt out. So we knew this current state had to change. Then we bring in the automation. And you'll notice for your eagle eyed out there, automation is number three. It's not number one. The reason automation is number three is because you have to streamline the process first. You have to know the process is good because a bad process automated is still a bad process. Again, you're just making something worse if it's already a bad process. So we use some design thinking, which is a, an amazing technique for thinking, how do we solve problems? It asks, about, it asks the phrase of how might we? So we ask the question of our team, how might we avoid the approvals or reduce the number of approvals? How might we uh, speed up the process? And you start to have some design thinking. And we also ended up with this entrepreneurial mindset. That was another benefit of this because we're going through this innovation we started to have people come up with new ideas. And as a result, they got time for strategic projects. They got to take vacations. Because remember here, they were burnt out because they weren't taking vacations. It was just a constant churn of financial reporting. And when I say business meetings, that was creating relationships with their business partners, with their other teams. So they got to involved in budget and forecasting, but not just reporting the numbers. They actually got to help the other teams do some forecasting around employees and, and hiring and recruitment. So they're actually building the future of the company together. They were seen as trusted advisors. So that's the benefit of this. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna take you through the AI automation ladder. I love frameworks. I love giving you things you can work through. So what I want to do now is talk about the steps, the five rungs of the ladder, because as I said, it does not start with automation. It actually starts with number one here, which is data and accuracy. So data and accuracy is your number one step. So why is that? Because as I said, if you if your bad process automated is still a bad process, so the first thing you need to do is make sure your data is good and you have an accurate, consistent, reliable process. You might have to streamline it. Then once you have that baseline, that foundation, then you can automate a report. And I'd love to hear from some of you folks in terms of some of the automation you've done, but what I've seen work well is just start with one report, just start with one chunk of the process. Because once you have good data and a report automated, then you can move up to what I'm going to call an internal process. My, my writing is not that good on a Thursday afternoon. So listen to what I say, not what I write. But internal process is what I'm writing there. The reason I'm saying internal process is because you want to keep it in the team. Again, you're building up your automation capabilities here. You've got good data. You've got a report pros, uh, automated. 
So then build out an end-to-end -end process, but keep it internal. Don't put it out to external customers yet. Get that proven. You may do so, for example, it might be the, um, the budget and forecasting. Forecast. That's a good internal process to stay. Once you've got the data and the reports done, then number four is when you can go external. That's when you can start to go out to customer facing or maybe even just other departments because you've proven your internal process automation. You can send to start engaging other people. And so maybe that's accounts payable, for example. Accounts payable. That's rung number four. Then once you've got the external one, then you can do a complete end-to-end -end external internal process. So this might be the whole financial close. Everything from the budget and expect the expenses, the credit card statements, then collecting the, the budget all the way through to the financial statements and the FPNA. That's when you get that whole financial close process done. But the point is you're building up like a ladder. You're walking up the rungs. Don't start at the number four or five because you're just you, your expectations will be too high or be get depressing when you can't automate everything. Again, I'll pause here, folks. Anyone who's done automation, work through some reports, what are your lessons learned here? What do you find works well with automation? Where did you start? So I can go, uh, basically, we identified a highly manual repetitive task. Highly mm -hmm. manual repetitive task. So we took an inventory of uh, across the company, and uh, there were many tasks were just repetitive, right? And... Uh, so we identified that. Then we started the AP, like accounts payable function, mm -hmm. and uh, like invoice key entry, invoice entry, then uh, matching those payments. And uh, we implemented the RPA bot on that. Nice. Awesome. And how did it go? What did you save? Oh, we saved some headcount, but uh, the but it was baked in. We redeployed some headcount, and uh, we kind of outsourced some of the function. We used the RPA. So there were some savings yeah. later. Yeah. That's awesome. And even if you're saving headcount, you touched, Ganesh, you thank you for that. Cause you say you touched on a really good point is this, what do you do with the savings? Yeah. Cause one of my, one of the big mistakes most people make with automation is they don't do anything with the time they save. You just fill it with more meetings or more yeah. reports and everyone's like, well, I'm still busy. That's the point. You have to identify that time and then say, okay, what are we going to do yeah. with that time? Yeah. Yeah. Great point. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. Okay. So we're going to keep moving because, again, we've got uh, the rest of technology. We're coming towards the end of technology, but we want to touch team as well. So if you're looking to where to start, as Ganesh said there, look at your maybe accounts payable. This is a, a typical financial close process. But the point here is just start small. Pick something. Maybe you just start with where's the AP going there as well. There's the, uh, the data warehouse and data processing, or maybe just the working papers. Just start with one chunk of your financial reporting process. Don't try and automate it all. Because you won't get to things like cash flow statements without that building up that good data, that foundation, understanding how the automation works. So I always like to just give you something to work to. Maybe you have your process mapped out. The point here is you have to map out that process to pick off the areas to automate, chain it together. Process mapping is so important because otherwise, what are you, what are you automating? So I often get a question. What if the automation's wrong? What if it doesn't work? Well, here's the answer. Because 50% automated is still 100% awesome. Even if it's only half of the job doing it, it's going to free up 50% of your time. Even if it's 30 or 40% or automated, that's still going to be amazing because it's freeing up your time, folks. Don't think I have to hit the 100%. Any percentage here is a good percentage because you're on that automation journey, you're freeing up time. So just remember that when you're going through automation, it's not easy, but it's simple. The steps are very simple, but it's hard work to get through and the results are always going to be good as long as you can get to that automation. So again, we're coming towards the end of technology. Usually this is a breakout, but for this, I'm going to give you a little bit of homework. Some of you are already doing it. That's awesome. If you are, Think about how else you could apply automation. Start with the pain points. 
what's annoying what's frustrating or as ganesh said what's the, the highly repetitive what's the manual process that your team are working with start there and then just think okay could we do it better and by the way it might not be automation it might be why are we doing this and we shouldn't be doing it let's do something else let's let's remove the approval sometimes you can remove a, a streamliner process just by rethinking how you do it okay yep got that so in terms of a final checklist whoops zoom in why is that doing that let's just go here there we go so i want to leave you with a checklist so you probably know this already again we'll send you a copy of these slides so first thing, know your target. We talked about target in the first section. So when you're automating, what's the goal? Then audit the process with your team. Don't think think you need to have the answer. Fix the process, streamline it. Again, a bad process automated is still a bad process. Then which task could be automated? That's when you get into automation. Step three. So that's why it's here. Whoops. Step three is there. Then the fill. The fill is so important because if you don't fill the time, you're in the same place, but just with more technology. And as I said, start small, review the results and repeat, like build it up. This is the scaling. And by the way, once you get to this step here, it's a loop because it might change your target because if you have achieved your target, sometimes these are six months out, sometimes it's six days out, sometimes it's six years out, it doesn't matter. You get the results and then update the target. And that's the loop of the checklist for automation. Okay. Moving on to the final section, team. Again, I'm compressing a lot, folks. I know I'm putting a ton of information your way and always happy to pause for uh, questions on this. This should actually say number three there. Number three is team. Any questions on, let's just go back. Any questions on technology before we move on to team? It's going to check the chat as well. Make sure I'm going to make sure I go back to those questions you had at the beginning there, folks. Make sure I cover that prioritization. Oh, yeah. So prioritization in terms of which projects to work on. Let me just think about this. Actually, yeah, you know what? I'm going to cover it here. So as part of team, so, so as a Stuart mentioned prioritization, a real neat trick for prioritization is, is called RICE. I don't know if you've seen this. But it's a real quick way to understand which project you should work on. So the first one is reach, as in how many people, the number of people, oops, would it impact? Sorry, would it, would it, yeah, would it impact number of people, high, medium, low? Then you get into impact or the benefit. So what's the benefit, high, medium, low? Then you get into confidence. Confidence. You get, you get what I mean. Confidence. So how <laughs> likely are you going to fix it? So again, high, medium, low. And then the last one is E is for effort. How difficult will it be? High, medium, low. Just assign a score. So high, medium, low for each one. One, two, three for each high, medium, low. That gives you a score. It's a very quick way of assessing projects for should I do this technology? Should I do this? But again, all of this needs to be tied up to your target. Because if it doesn't contribute to your target, you shouldn't be doing it. You shouldn't even be assessing it. That's one way to prioritize. And by the way, this also helps with the change of mindset because you're asking, ask your team these questions. When they're doing a new project, ask them what the benefit is. Ask them their level of confidence. Ask them the level of effort. And then you start to get their engagement in the project. And they could also push back and say, yep, I don't think this is going to work. Okay, why is that? It's a great conversation starter for change management as well. Okay, awesome. Let's keep going. Talk about team. So we talked about digital adoption. We talked about maturity. So now we're going to talk about the value. How do we bring it all together? Because your role is changing. 
this is how it used to be. The tri I love this triangle. So it's all about transactions, compliance, analytics, and decisions. Pretty much all of us do this, but it's moving to a new way of working. It's moving to much more. Oops. And one second. Why does that do that? Moving to much more analysis and decisions. It's the bigger weight of our role because technology is taking over here. That's where AI is coming in. Automation. It's starting to take over our transactions, our data entry. So where do you fit in? That's where it moves up to the analysis. So let's talk about AI because here's how it can be used. Here's how it can be used for AI for analytics to help you make better decisions because it is a tidal wave. It is coming at us. And the questions I often get are, it's interesting, but what about the errors? It isn't ready for accounting and will it kill us all? I actually don't think it will, but you have to make sure you use it in the right way because AI is changing accounting. This study from um, the Volker's Kluwer uh, research here to say, okay, where can we use AI? And the most areas are at the top here. Marketing, tax, client communication. So this is applying AI to work on something. So it's not going to it's not going to do your marketing for you, but it can help with the marketing. And this could be internal marketing, could be sharing updates on a project, part of the communications, could be presenting new uh, new reports. But the point here is the research. Use it to help you decipher, interpret tax codes, compliance requirements, regulatory. You can use it to summarize new pronouncements. So if a disclosure for crypto assets come out from, it's a 50 page document, it came out just recently, quickly summarize that crypto disclo disclosure. And the reason for this is because there's so much choice of applications. So let's go here. This is just a sample of all the AI apps out there. This is this is scratching the surface, folks. There's so many out there. But these are some I've used. I mean, t check them out in terms of some of the, the tax provisioning. Oops. Eh, why is that doing that? This is my technology for you today. The tax provisioning. Tax GPT is a cool one. Check it out. It does the tax code specifically. It does its AI for tax codes if you don't uh, I'd love to know if you've used it I, i've used it a couple of times it works really well but there's lots of others to help you with the automation so if we look at automation look at things like black line automation anywhere ui path i think someone mentioned yeah it's over here as well there's a lot of ai automation here it comes overwhelming again don't feel overwhelmed because you can select the right tool based on your target and the, and the automation that you want to use. So pick that process and then pick the technology. Has anyone used any of these tools? Is there any other tools that people have used? Love to hear from you in terms of AI tools, because this really is your team. When you, when you say use, you mean as a user, uh, you know, uh, looking up stuff or uh, utilizing the service. Yep. Yeah. As in you personally, have you, have you used any AI tools? Uh, Backline. Power BI and um, what is it? Uh, is that, not the index. Um, well, it's in here somewhere. I saw it, another one. One of the two of them in here. Yeah. Yeah. Power BI is awesome. I love that. Would then just curious, what are you using Power BI AI for? Uh, it's uh, used to automate a series of reports looking for uh, discrepancies between the f the previous version and the new version that's online. So we have a bunch of projects that are changing. So what is the difference between last week and this week? Right. Nice. Awesome. And in, and hopefully then using that to understand what. Um where you can save time or effort with your business to improve efficiency. Again, make sure you fill that gap. Well, they use it to uh, ding us project managers. So uh, that, that's what they use it for. Mm, <laughs> nice. Yeah. Awesome. And then uh, 
Noni or Noni. Apologies if I didn't pronounce your name properly, but ChatGPT, Power BI, and Blackline and Vertex. Yep. Awesome. And then Mike's and these are the main tools. Yep. There's a lot of, there's tons of tools out there. They're, they're changing rapidly as well. There's a lot of vaporware out there where they're promising things that don't exist yet. But just the point is just keep an eye on the market. Sessions like this, when he was sharing, yeah, Robert, yeah, using Blackline. There's a lot of great tools out there. Uh, Conversite AI. Oh, I've not heard of that one that she's on the list. Yeah. The, um, yeah, I'll have to check that one out. Thanks, Ganesh, for using that as well. Yeah, and uh, Mike saying co-pilot every day. Yes, <laughs> it's it's addictive. Once you start getting into it, you do it over and over again. Here's a talking to co-pilot. Here's a great example. I I use this all the time for co-pilot for hiring. So I was working with a client. They wanted to hire a tax accountant. So I don't know about you, but when we're hiring, it's like oh, I've got to write a job description. So I used the 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 co-pilot to actually create the job description for me. So that was step one. Oops, let's go back. I don't know why it does that. The job description up here. And then I said, give me some interview questions. So based on the job description, list 10 interview questions. And so it listed them. The problem is people are starting to use AI to create resumes. So they're taking the job description and asking AI to create the perfect resume. So it's difficult to understand if they're being real or it's true. So how do I validate her resume? Give me 15 questions or five, five questions to validate the resume. I don't put her personal details in there, but I put the the text in there. Say, so, okay, give, give me this experience. What would I ask Jane? And then that gave me a load of great questions. So it's just little things like that to use chat GPT, co-pilot, to just do our day jobs better, faster. MDNA, it does the the statements, does financial forecasting. We can do, use a lot. It's getting really, really powerful. It, it just I was just the other day pasting in some for my own tax return for my business. I was pasting in the tax, sorry, the credit card statements, PDFs, saying pull out all the expenses, classify them, give me the dates, and it puts it into a table, creates a the total, and that gives me the information I need for my tax return. Very, very quick. You're probably thinking, why is QuickBooks not doing that for me? But <laughs> We all know the integrations don't always work. So sometimes we have to resort to manual methods, but there's other options. Also want to just quickly share a prompt guide. So if you're new to AI prompting, this is a great way of using AI prompts. So you start with the goal. Oh my God, why does that keep doing that? Let me go back. Start with the goal. Then the context, so why do you need this? Give it some context. A great example here for an upcoming meeting. The more context you give it, the better. And then that sets expectations around what would be a good response. And then is there an example? Or even ask it to give you the sources where it got that information from. So this is how you construct a prompt. If anyone's wondering about how you work with AI, you have to give it the more details you give it. Again, better questions, get better answers. So this is how this works. It sounds like you, a lot of you folks are using AI already. If you're not, try it out. Just, just try Copilot, ChatGPT. They're typically free, but just gets you to understand how advanced they are in terms of the search. They're, you can search for anything. Anything you put into Google to search, just put in ChatGPT or Copilot and see what it says. Just out of curiosity, is, is there a more robust or better developed AI? Like is Copilot better than ChatGPT or does that even make a, a reasonable comparison? Yeah, and I find the difference. So I, I actually use Claude AI, Copilot and ChatGPT. And I typically put the same question into all three of them, see which gives me the better answer. And then sometimes I'll take a good answer from Claude and then put it into ChatGPT saying, hey, can you improve on this? So I mix and match, but I find Claude, for example, has a more conversational response. I find ChatGPT is faster generally, and I find Copilot is very good for sources. It's very good at, it automatically gives you the sources. So I'll I'll keep, I keep trying with different ones, but to your, answer your question, no, I haven't found one that's better unless anyone on the call has, has found one that's better. So oh, Tammy there. Is Perplexity Pro, and if you are mm -hmm. a LinkedIn Premium user, 
you get to use it for the next year for free. Oh, and cool. It's really good because it kind of leverages several LLMs. So it uses mm. chat and Claude and a few others that I can't remember right now. I'll theft up at. So check your email because you probably did get um, an email during August letting you know. And there's a link in that email. It takes five minutes to sign up for Perplexity Pro. Wow. Thank you. Yeah, because I, I have started to use Perplexity, but not um, not the Pro version. So that's cool. And I do have a LinkedIn uh, professional account. So awesome. Thanks for sharing. Yep. And then, like I said, like an actually list the source as well. So I, my point is, I would just try one of them. Just if, if you're not sure which one, just just start testing it out. Just try it. Because what you'll do is you'll learn prompting. And again, it's learning how to work with these tools because they're becoming more and more prevalent in, our, in everyday life. So again, we've covered a lot here, folks. I'm going to go to the next slide. I had to compress a lot into just the, the time I have. So we talked about the three secrets. We talked about the targets, technology, and the team. And the whole point here was to understand digital transformation and ultimately inspire you. We didn't get into some details because we didn't go through the workshops, but I wanted to inspire you to find and fix those hidden inefficiencies. I'm hoping it's starting to fire some brain neurons here. So tomorrow when you hit the hit the desk or hit the office, you're thinking, okay, let's let's take a step back and let's look at that. I want to go back to here, folks. We, we won't do the poll again, but wherever you think you were, whether you're a, a compact, well, we had a lot of sporty SUVs. So for anyone who's up here, where do you go next? What do you need to do differently? Maybe you need to refine your target. Maybe you need to use AI with your team. Maybe you need to share, the, the get their input around automation. And if you're a compact, where do you want to go? Do you want to in introduce some more technology? Do you want to introduce some more maturity around delivery? The point is there's no right or wrong path. You just have to move up the path because ultimately it's all around that customer value. What else do I need to make sure I cover? Oh, the other thing I wanted just to quickly share with you is that I mentioned that... Uh, score app so i've done a, um, a quick assessment that's free just takes two minutes and i'll put it in the chat here as well because it gives you again no obligation there's no sign up or anything like that but it gives you an idea of how to um improve your digital maturity your digital transformation and highlight areas of improvement so it's 12 questions takes about two minutes take a look at it check it out it's a real neat way multiple choice very easy to do but it will give you some instant report in terms of what you could do to improve your business, find inefficiencies and make things better. So just share that in the chat for everyone as well. Okay, um, but if you're feeling overwhelmed, I appreciate this is a lot. Sometimes feels like drinking from the fire hose. 